Hello and welcome back. We are still talking about section 5.1. This third video we are going to uh, finish up this last learning objective, set up and solve separable differential equations. So let's see if we can get in position here. So separable differential equation, not quite as uh, you know, talk downy, condescending as a simple differential equation. So, um, separable is also trying to be a helpful definition here. Um, it is a differential equation, so that's, I don't know, comforting, I guess, since that's involved in its name. But uh, it's one that, if you recall, for simple, we just had this stuff with x's on the right side, and a separable one has, uh, it may also have some terms with y's on the right side. So, that's, I think that's basically the way to interpret this is that. We can't get it so it just looks like a bunch of x's on the right side. It, we have terms that involve both y's and x's, and in particular so that they can be sorted like this. We could actually have x's on top, y's on bottom. Um, we'll see some, so it doesn't really matter if, if we can have those on top and the others on bottom, but uh, right, we'll, we'll operate from, from there. So what we really need is, is to be able to write these as a, a product of x things and y things, basically. Okay, so uh, this is, as you might expect, basically one step harder than a simple differential equation. Now, instead of just getting all the x stuff to the right side, um, which is exactly what we do for the simple differential equation, now, in order to, to kind of balance this out, we also end up with a side that has a bunch of y's on it. Um, and, you know, okay, two integrals are better than one. Let's, let's, we can operate with the glass half full perspective on that one. Uh, but there's also kind of this awkward moment where you're multiplying by dy and multiplying by g of y. So I'm going to draw this and then a little part of my soul is going to die. But, um, yeah, so we're essentially we're getting d, g, what, g of y and dy together. We're getting f of x and dx together, and then we're integrating those two things. And this is not a property of equality that we were ever given in our algebra classes, but uh, we're sort of thinking that, well, if these two expressions are the same, then their antiderivatives will be the same too. And that's, you know, true enough, basically. <laughs> okay, so uh, we're going to try out a word problem with this because, man, word problems are great. So this is the rate of change in volume in uh, cubic centimeters in particular of water in a draining container is proportional to the square root of the volume of the water after t seconds. So that's a mouthful. We'll have to decode that a little bit here. And then in particular, they give us the constant of proportionality. And uh, our task is to find a model for volume of water, given that initially the container holds 400 cubic centimeters. And maybe just a historical note, uh, this, this proportional to the square root business is not made up. Uh, this is often referred to as Torricelli's law. So if you just have like a bucket and you poke a hole in the bottom, then uh, initially when the volume is high, then the water drains faster and then it drains a little bit slower as the, the volume gets lower as well. So it's not a totally crazy model, I guess. I'm just playing defense here. All right, so whew, uh, there's some translation that's got to happen here because we, we don't, there's no equation anywhere here, right? There's no differential equation that's staring at us. We're going to have to build it, use these, uh, this idea of mathematical modeling. So we'll take the first thing they say, the rate of change in volume, and we'll just tack on the mathy version of that. So here's volume. Let's say it's uh, with respect to time. Then DDT of that volume, or, or uh, you may... In fact, not may, if you're like my students, uh, vastly prefer v prime as a way of noting this. But actually, this is differential equations are the, maybe the first time where it seems really important to have this notation uh, in, your, in your wheelhouse as well. Okay, so the rate of change in volume is proportional to the square root of volume. Well, so is generally becomes an equal sign in math. Proportional to means there's some constant, something that doesn't get to change, but specific to this situation, times the square root of volume. So just very carefully translating this word statement into a mathematical expression. And then they're nice enough to hand us this constant of proportionality, 0.044. So in other words, k, that's this fella, is 0.044. So if we put these three things together, we get ourselves a differential equation, actually. So uh, just to be as, as clear as possible, this, this guy right here is what we had written in this slightly 
more awful fashion as DDT of V of T. And, you know, these aren't different things, but basically the only part that's gone away is we've gotten rid of the explicit function notation here. So, we're, yes, volume is some function of time, and we're assuming that because, hey, look, on the bottom there's a derivative with T. So really we just got rid of the parentheses and T and everything else is staying the same. So great, here's our differential equation. Uh, and, and this is the problem. If, if, if you take a look at this carefully, you're sort of tempted to just take the integral of the right side, to take the integral of the left side, undo the derivatives. But the, the catch here is this is not T. I mean, I feel sort of weird saying that because obviously this letter is not the letter T. Um, but this is more important than just a letter difference. This V is its own function. It's a function of time. So we can't just take this integral on the left side, dt, and call it a day. So what we can do, you know, here's, here's our, little, uh, our little rescue boat over here. Here's dv on the left side. If we could get this stuff with v's in it over there, then our integral would, would pan out pretty nicely. So uh, what I'm supposed to be thinking about basically is uh, dt would get, um, uh, again, a little part of me dies every time we, we do this, but we'll think about this as multiplying by dt. That's, you know, almost, almost a thing. And then uh, here's our square root of v business, and we'll manage to get that over to the left side. And we'll just do algebra to make that happen. So we could divide by square root of v, for instance. So we can move this stuff with v's on it. If we do that, we divide by square root of v. We've still got this dv hanging out the dt pops over, this is actually a pretty decent place to be. Um, because now if we integrate, we've got all v stuff on the left side, all t stuff on the right side. Well, okay, it's dt and then a constant. You really could have brought this 0.044 along for the ride too. You could have divided it over to the left side. I like to keep it there. I don't know. It feels sort of lonely on the right side if there's no actual visible constants there. It's just integral of dt. So I don't know. I'm throwing dt a bone, basically. Just keep it, keep it company over there. And then we follow through with the integration. So integral of the left side, integral of the right side. Uh, so remember, this, this probably is, is worth a quick algebraic rewrite. So uh, get that guy circled there. And uh, this is the same thing as v to the 1 half power. We've actually already made use of that in one of the early videos. Um, and because it's in the denominator, then that's really v to the negative 1 half, because that's how negative exponents work. And, and this is convenient precisely because once we have it written like variable, which is v in this case, to the power, then we can use power rule, which is great. So. Uh, the power goes up by one, we have negative one-half plus one gets us to positive one-half. And then technically, so again, maybe this is worth a little side note. So here's our v to the negative one-half. We add one to it. We divide by that new power. And uh, negative one-half plus one is still a one-half. But since we're dividing by it, then we end up with positive two getting multiplied out in front. So divide by a half is the same as multiply by two. Okay, uh, the right side is less interesting, but hey, it's still perfectly fine. Integral of a constant, we can use that constant rule. We don't get x, we gotta be super careful because this is, this is actually the, the case where this dt matters the most, having this little differential guy there. Um, this reminds me that t is technically the, the variable of integration. So when this comes, the, the constant rule comes out of this and tells us that we tack on the variable, t is that variable. So we have the constant we had before, 0.044 times t, and then plus some constant. I'm kind of playing games with the constants here. I'm not trying to mess with your mind, but I sort of want the final answer to have the, just the c business in it. Uh, and so technically what happens is out of each of these two integrals comes its own constant of integration. And then it turns out nobody cares, but we just we'll, you've got to go through a process here. So in theory, there are two arbitrary constants, but ultimately we're going to work toward just one. And just to quickly work the math of that uh, through for a second here, um, let's uh, we'll go with a different color just to try to keep things clear. So uh, C1, for instance, could get subtracted over here. We'd have minus C1 on the right side, and then that guy's gone. We would divide everybody by two, so sure, divide this by two. We'd, and then we have to divide this guy by two as well. Well, okay, 
here's the thing about arbitrary constants. They are arbitrary. <laughs> so if you had any constant minus any other constant divided by two, that's all just a freaking constant there. There's nothing special going on with all of that. We might as well just call all of this stuff, one half C2 minus C1, we just give that a new name. And that's why I've been holding this uh, C back so we can have our final answer have just a plain old C in it. So this will happen a lot with separable differential equations in particular, where you have each side generates its own constant of integration, and you basically end up being able to combine them into a single one in the end. You can do this however it's convenient for you and doesn't break your brain. Accent on not breaking your brain, because that's, that's super important. We're almost done solving for, for v at this point, because that's this is acting like our y. The volume function is acting like the y thing we're trying to solve for. So the last thing we do is get rid of this 1 half power by squaring everybody. So we take that entire right side, square it, and fantastic, we have a volume function. So this is not one that you could take to your family and say, look, now I have a volume function, because this constant is still playing around in there, and that's not super helpful. Um, it means that we would have uh, you know, any number that we could add on to that, which is not super great. Uh, that's when we make this particular solution decision. It's been like, I don't know, it feels like three and a half hours at this point, but back when this problem started, they told us initially, in other words, when t equals zero, there were 400 cubic centimeters in this container. So in other words, t equals zero implies v equals 400. And this is good enough for us to solve for c, because once I know what uh, value of v is, 400, we have a value for t, 0, then we get uh, c is equal to, and I, f I feel like I have to take a little side venture here just, just to see what this looks like, because um, you guys have been doing algebra for a while, and you know that if you introduce a new square root to an equation, which is what we have to do in order to get rid of this square, this uh, plus or minus business comes along for the ride. And often, especially in word problems, we're like, oh, pick the positive value. Negative things don't make sense in word problems. But that's actually not the case here. Um, what, what's going on is a little more subtle than that. So this, this plus C is essentially giving us the, uh, the opportunity to choose between two types of functions. So you can probably tell me that uh, if we look at this V thing, having T squared means that we have a choice between a uh, parabola well, it's going to look like some kind of parabola. But basically, this plus c is giving us the choice between uh, the, the two following broad cases. So they could actually, I'll try to make them meet up. Yeah, there you go. So both of these parabolas have an initial value of 400. So that's, that's, that's not different between them. So let's say that this height right there is 400. But these, are, these give us very different shapes on the, the right side. So for instance, in this blue case, if what we're mapping is volume against time, and I guess I should just say, what we're mapping is volume against time, then this says that starting initially, you poke a hole in the bottom of your bucket and it starts filling up rapidly. That doesn't really fit with the physical properties of this problem. But if this green graph uh, shows us draining slightly more rapidly, and then it reaches a point, uh, and I've, I'm sorry for my, my poor artistic ability here, but both of these graphs actually do end up bottoming out at some point, where the bucket is empty. And then functionally what we would do is we would say, oh yeah, uh, this other part of the graph doesn't work for our, the application part of this problem, so the domain would just end when t is equal to whatever makes this zero. And that's, that's great. But if we're picking between these two options, it actually turns out uh, we can use our great uh, knowledge of graph transformations or whatever it is, but the blue case is actually the one where C is positive. And the green case, the one that most likely corresponds to the situation that we're actually studying here, the green case is the one where C is negative. Okay, so this is, this is, a, this is a tangent, um, but it's an important one for this question because uh, picking these two options is, is non-trivial. So, uh, you know, I like to do some of the harder problems in these videos as well. So, uh, you can take this and say, look, if this was a test question, hopefully your teacher would make it right one way or another. But uh, in this case, we really do want the negative. So C is negative 20 would be the answer that we're really looking for. So ultimately, we replace C with negative 20. We get ourselves a volume function. And by golly, it feels like we've worked hard enough that we've earned a box around that. 
uh, just to, you know, put it on a pedestal and say, nice job. Okay, so that concludes section 5.1. We finished off uh, separable differential equations. I'll see you for another video.